Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today in what is a, a, a different chat, a fireside chat, with an opportunity for us to discuss with some of the leaders in the uh, mobile ecosystem. Uh, and this time we have a pleasure to talk with Anurag Lal. Um, Anurag, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Anurag it. is, uh, well, a, a famous face within the mobile ecosystem within MAF has been an, a member uh, and uh, often been asked to comment on different topics. As I said today, we have a, a different take. We have a bit more of time. And we can take a, a more wider approach talking about the mobile ecosystem and not just the mobile ecosystem. If we want mm -hmm. the regulations and everything that happens in this fantastic world. <clears throat> I also like to remember to people what um, Anurag <clears throat> does. You are the president and CEO of Infinite Convergence, previously also working as some of the big names in the industry, whoever been Sprint, BT, IPAS, uh, to, to mention some, and your leadership over 25 years in uh, mobile technology, software as a service. Am I missing something, Anurag? Tell me. No, I think, I think you've covered that quite well, Dario. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, uh, you're being too kind uh, talking about my experience and uh, my, my know-how and my positioning in the industry. But uh, yes, I have been in the industry for a while. It's given me an opportunity to look at uh, a wide-ranging set of uh, challenges, uh, everything from software to platforms to services, uh, and also gave me an opportunity to be part of... Uh, a regulatory thought process too when I had a chance to work with the FCC as part of the National Broadband Task Force. So yes, so a, a, a good varied experience uh, across the globe. So happy to provide you my perspective from that on that side. Perfect and perfect and, and thanks for reminding us that you you've been appointed by the Obama administration uh, in uh, under the FCC <clears throat> as a director of the U.S. National Broadband Task Force. So my first question is really about that. Um, it would be, what, what, what did you get to understand and about the, the regulation of the fix, first of all, fixed world, but also of the, the mobile world? What is a broadband today and what is missing in the, in the broadband world? Sure. No, that's a great question. And, and to, just to give you a perspective about the, the broadband task force, that was actually mandated by President Obama. He had made an election promise. Uh, to go out and make sure that the broadband availability, both wireline and wireless broadband, was made an important part of his telecommunications policy. And so the task force was actually set up to understand and, um, and realize um, all the challenges that existed in the availability of broadband across the board and see how those could be overcome to ensure that broadband was more available across the US economy. And, and there was a very strong belief that broadband availability had a direct linkage uh, to the com competitive nature of an economy. And the US over, the, over a period of time had kind of fallen behind and President Obama wanted to make sure that we put that back on the front burner again and push that availability back up. So as part of that task force, we looked at every aspect of technology, broadband connectivity technology, whether that be uh, cable, uh, wired broadband, uh, wireless broadband, and, and in all its forms, including satellite. And, and we went out and uh, looked at what were the ideal policies, both for the public and the private sector, to work together to ensure that broadband was made available across the economy, regardless of your income position or your location within the country. And as I'm sure you appreciate, um, the United States is a very large ge geography right? And to deploy technology to have ubiquitous broadband coverage across that geography is expensive and time consuming. And so we wanted to maximize that opportunity and provide guidance to the industry to go out and make sure that they went out and deployed aggressively. Um, I think the benefits of that uh, uh, task force have been numerous. Uh, and I think it was great work. My particular opportunity within the task force to really to go out and look at other economies that had done a great job of making broadband a very important aspect of their, um, their, their economy, right? And so we looked at the Nordics. The Nordics have always been leading with regards to broadband availability. We looked at you know, countries like South Korea. We looked at uh, Japan. We looked at uh, Singapore. 
And we tried to learn from them as well because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and now if you look back, uh, and I'm not trying to take credit for the position the US has with regards to broadband availability, but if you now take a look, uh, I think the US is very well positioned with regards to 4G wireless availability, right? Uh, they are, uh, have aggressively deployed it and they continue to extend the, 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 the reach of that network. We also have very good broadband uh, availability from a wireline perspective too. We also got a bunch of different ways that broadband is being made available for the economic part of uh, the United States that may not afford, uh, may not be able to afford uh, broadband itself. So I think if you look at the work done and the progress that's been made, I think the task force uh, established a good uh, baseline. They educated the industry and also the, um, the, the policymakers with regards to why broadband was important, why it needed to be available, why it needed to be deployed. And I think progress has been made. Uh, and I think the benefits of their progress are obviously evident uh, to, to the people at large. So let me ask you now as well, <clears throat> there was true for the U.S., you, you look outside, you brought some interesting uh, ideas to the U.S. A few years later, are you looking at some other of the parts of the world, and I'm looking at both of the emerging as well as mature markets, where are still missing some of this learning, something that could still be done globally um, to improve the availability of the broadband services across the different parts of the, of the uh, of the consumer. Yeah, Daryl, you're absolutely right because you know there is no stage of Nirvana where there is ubiquitous broadband availability across the board, right? And and so when we were in the task force, we looked at other countries that had succeeded in certain policy measures and other incentives that they provided to the private sector to allow broadband to be more ubiqu ubiquitously deployed, right? Whether that be access to last mile access to copper, access to fiber, uh, access to more spectrum in the case of wireless, right? But today, across the globe, there's a huge portion of the population, of the global population, that does not have access to broadband. And uh, I think there are leading edge technologies that are satellite-based, uh, drone-based, balloon-based, that could potentially be deployed. And I think the private sector is doing a lot of work in, in that uh, uh, regard in trying to get that out. But I think there is a huge gap that still remains with regards to broadband availability. And, and I think that's really where the opportunity is. But I think the first step in broadband availability within an organized, uh, within a, a, a country, if you may, has to be a realization of their governments and their uh, policy makers that broadband is key to an economy's success. Broadband is key to maintaining the competitiveness of an economy. Broadband is a key factor for the, the economy that is relevant today, which is the internet-based economy, right? So if there is a realization to those three areas, these governments will make that a huge and important part of their policy, will allocate appropriate funds and investments in those areas to be able to push that out. And I think they can be help given from uh, other entities as well, like the UN and the IMF and others, to make that a singular important uh, part of their giving and outreach as well. Uh, because of the fact that broadband has such an immense impact on a particular economy, immense impact on an economy's ability to offer jobs, yeah. and clearly joblessness is also a huge problem in the, uh, across the globe today, right? So if we are doing the right thing with making broadband available, regardless of what technology it uses, I think it has a positive effect on an economy, which ultimately has a positive effect on jobs, which ultimately makes sure that that, you know, that, that circle continues to thrive, pushing that economy forward. So <clears throat> let me ask you now, if you had the free wish, the famous free wish, three things that are at regulatory level could be done, to improve the life through broadband to many, what would that be? What would you ask for? I, I think it's, it's very important for people to understand that a large portion that ensures, a large portion of, of, of what ensures broadband availability is 
handled and managed by most policy-based governments, right? And I think it'll be very important for those governments to start making aspects of those policies a little more open and more available. So I'll give you one of my big choices, spectrum availability. I think it's very, very important for countries to farm and re-farm existing spectra in order to make that available to the private sector. All right, and it's also very important to ensure that that spectrum is provided in a cost-effective manner. Uh, there are too many economies that try to make um, the availability of spectrum a business. Uh, and I would, I would say, I would challenge these governments uh, that you know, give spectrum, you know, you know, make it more cost effective, make it more available so that you have wider bands of spectrum available in a much more cost effective manner. And then this, uh, the other unlicensed part of the spectrum, I think there's a huge opportunity to make a larger band and allocate that to unlicensed spectrum that then will drive innovation around technologies like Wi-Fi and others. Because Wi-Fi itself has a huge role in ensuring the availability of broadband in a manner that's much more convenient than it was in the past, right? It's uh, Wi-Fi is much more ubiquitous and I've been always a big fan of Wi-Fi, but it's always restricted by the amount of spectrum that's available to it. And so my second wish would be to you know, make that spectrum available much more conveniently. The third piece I think is regulation and deregulation. There's a lot of talk about regulating industries, regulating the internet, regulating companies that are successful. Uh, and you know, I have in my experience seen too much regulation can be very stifling, right? They have to be rules and, and, and the rules have to be, be very clear and people should work and um, play within those rules. But overreaching regulation that stifles innovation and slows down economies, I think, and creates bureaucracy, I think is, um, is, is really contradictory to the whole purpose. So again, to recap, I think um, make policies available that help the industries make more spectrum available, both in the licensed uh, side bands, as well as in the unlicensed band to drive more innovation and make broadband more affordable because I think the spectrum prices cost is what really drives up the price of broadband availability. And, and then the third piece is, you know, when it comes to regulation, um, provide rules, but don't provide overarching regulation that actually slows economies down because of the bureaucracy that's now built in to manage that regulation. Because ultimately with that, with that um, regulation being far reaching and overreaching, people spend money and time to manage it, which also adds to the affordability piece of broadband. So those three things, I think, would be great wishes for all economies to look at. And there are certain governments that do it better than others. Uh, we noticed in the Nordic, Nordics, um, Spectrum was pretty much given away in a beauty contest kind of a thought process. Other parts of the globe, uh, you know, we see Spectrum being charged for arm and a leg based on an auction, right? I think there has to be some kind of a middle ground that makes it available in a much more cost-effective manner. And I think everybody then gets the benefit of it, especially the economy of those particular countries who take advantage of that. Let me ask you something which is uh, almost topical, but we, 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 we've heard a lot about 5G over the last few years. We've now seen 5Gs really being deployed, announced and deployed in US and South Korea, in other places. Um, is 5G a solution to all of the problems in fixed, we've heard, and wireless, or are we still missing something? Is there still something out there? Right, and I think, I think that's a great uh, question, Dari. I think 5G is going to be a huge upgrade from a technology perspective, performance, latency, density, um, uh, and, 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 and all of that has the benefits of making um, wireless connectivity at a broadband level that much more available across the economy, right? We've also seen real proof, tangible proof where 5G, because of its uh, uh, you know, advantages around latency and density, will push forth uh, you know, applications like IoT, right? L applications like autonomous driving, uh, 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 applications like VR and AR, that are being done on a wide area basis, right? Um, 
all of those advantages are going to be reflected in Indian economy. I, I think 5G is going to be uh, an excellent uh, thought process when it comes to an economy and its ability to be more competitive and its ability to drive additional applications and opportunities for within the economy. That being said, 5G is not a silver bullet. Ultimately, you will still have to get spectrum. You will still have to be able to invest in technology to deploy those networks. Um, and all of that is going to cost and take time and effort. Um, but I think as a technology, it's a great evolution for wireless connectivity. It has great promises for driving additional applications because of the technological advantages it presents, like the reduced latency, higher density, higher throughput. Uh, and all of that can be taken advantage of and will be taken advantage of by economies and countries who aggressively go out and deploy those networks. So I think, I think it's a great thing, but definitely not a silver bullet. Let me ask you one more thing, and it's one of my favorite topic right now, but uh, wireless and, and fixed broadband availability have given a lot of opportunities, and we always talked about the consumer side and what's happening there. Mm -hmm. What about the enterprise and the digitalizations of processes of the internal um, industries itself? Um, are we seeing all that could be done? Is there more? Where are we in the enterprise digitalization uh, landmark? Right. So the enterprise basically, you know, mimics a consumer's life. In the in the consumer life, it's kind of replicated in the enterprise, right? Enterprises need connectivity at a very high density level because of. Uh, the employees that they have within their organization. Enterprises also uh, are the ones who will be investing in new verticals and new technologies and new use cases, levering, leveraging the new uh, technologies like 5G that are becoming available. So I think a consumer and an enterprise kind of go hand in hand, right? Digi digitization is an absolute, uh, it's happening today across the board, including the enterprise. We see that in our business. Uh, you know, we provide a secure uh, enterprise uh, uh, messaging environment uh, that actually is a answer to consumer uh, capabilities that are leaking into the enterprise. So, uh, and the enterprise is no different. Uh, and in fact, the applications I talked about in the context of 5G, like IoT, and autonomous driving, AR, VR, uh, AI, and others, all of those will be benefited and will be driven by enterprises who are going to take advantage of these new technologies that are becoming available, right? And as they take advantage, I think it helps the enterprise as well. So the consumer is excited, the enterprise is prepared and ready to go. In fact, they have already started investing in some of these areas, understanding that these technologies are coming down the road. So the digitization is real. Uh, high density service availability within the enterprise is a real requirement. And replicating and taking advantages of some of these new technologies is absolutely important for those enterprises to stay relevant. We do it on an ongoing basis at our organization through the services we sell and provide to enterprises. We all the, all, already seeing the applicability of those services within the enterprise for the reasons that I just talked about. So I think it'll all come together uh, at the end of the day, because you know the enterprise uh, on one side leverages everything that a consumer does in the consumer's life. And if I may ask one um, final remark, if you were to, to talk to a young Anran Lal, you know, 20 years ago, what would you tell yourself after all the things you've seen and learned to be prepared or to do better? What would be that suggestion you give yourself? Well, maybe I would have invested in some of the stocks I didn't invest, but no, <laughs> no, jokes aside, I think, I think the times that we are living in are absolutely phenomenal. If you look at the, the, the exponential progression of technology um, across the board that has taken place r right from the 90s to today is absolutely unbelievable, right? Uh, it's uh, some of the applications that we take for granted, including this conversation that we are having remotely with you being in the UK, I'm sitting here in Washington, uh, and doing it in a very seamless manner 
is unfathomable but going back to those times, right? Um, I think I, I recognize some of those technologies. I was always a big proponent uh, around wireless broadband. I was a big champion of Wi-Fi in the early days. Uh, in the actually going back to the early 90s, I, so, I, I think I foresaw um, the advantages that mobility and wireless connectivity would provide. And I pushed wireless uh, Wi-Fi, you know, extremely aggressively. They used to call it wireless LAN in those days. But, you know, hindsight being 2020, I think, and hindsight is always 2020, there, there are so many other use cases and applications that you could have taken advantage of. Uh, but 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 looking back um, is I think in my mind not helpful. Uh, looking forward is what I like to do. Uh, I can't but acknowledge the progression that has happened and the applications and the technologies and the devices that we are using today that we take for granted. Uh, but uh, but I, I I'm just excited and looking forward uh, to the next few years because I think the pace of uh, innovation based on all these new technologies like 5G and others is going to uh, increase exponentially and giving birth to technologies, applications, use cases, and conveniences that we today can't fathom. And I'm looking forward to that because I think it'll be an exciting time and I'm happy to be part of this uh, exciting and happening industry, if you may. Thank you, Anurag. Thanks again, thanks for this chat. And I hope we'll have a chance to continue our discussion very soon on the Mobile Ecosystem Forum or somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it.